Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, another good night and a late night, uh, but I hope uh, everybody's feeling energetic this morning because, yes, we've got another day that's uh, packed with energy and information and uh, hopefully going to continue to provoke a lot of discussion amongst the colleagues who are at the meeting. Uh, I've just got a couple of housekeeping things to, uh, to go over, and that is... Um, uh, after the uh, uh, sessions this evening, we will um, be having uh, shuttle buses that are going out to the Western Development Museum. And I'd like to encourage you all to join that, not because it's a, just another party, but if you've never been to uh, the Western Development Museum, it is uh, basically a physical history of the agricultural um, uh, the, the agricultural progress made in this province. Uh, some absolutely amazing equipment that goes back 150 years, uh, reminding us that we were actually at the cutting edge of agricultural technologies even then. Um, and for those of you who are um, uh, also aficionados of vintage cars, there's some amazing cars. It's like Elvis's garage, to be honest. So. Uh, you've really got to come and uh, we'll have some music and we'll, we'll finish off this, uh, this conference with a bit of a party. So uh, there will be buses waiting outside the Bespera going to the, the Western Development Museum at 5.15, 5.25, 5.35 and 5.45. And then there'll be buses returning from 8 o'clock. So um, I'll, I'll remind you of the times of those. Um, later on today again, but between 5.15 and 5.45, there'll be plenty of buses going down there for you. Uh, as it's the last plenary session that I can address everybody, I just want to say a uh, special thanks, first of all, to our colleagues at AgWest Bio, and I'm thinking particularly of uh, all the folks that did the hard work on the ground and the logistics, Nikki and Alison and her colleagues. I want to say a thank you especially to um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, staff from my office, uh, Amber, Cynthia, and Sarah, who've been working very hard with all the delegates to make sure they've uh, been able to find what they needed and, uh, and uh, meet with the right people. And also, uh, let's just mention Arj and uh, his IT and video crew. They've been absolutely superb. We've recorded this entire conference. We've live streamed part of it. As I said yesterday, we were up in the Twitter sphere number one yesterday, uh, and uh, it's in part because we've been able to rely on such great work from our uh, uh, video and IT team. So thank you to all of you. Okay, well, it's now uh, my, my pleasure to hand over the, uh, the uh, uh, chairpersonship to uh, Brian Harvey. Um, many of you know Brian, he's had a long and illustrious career as plant breeder here. He's now Professor Emeritus uh, in, in Plant Sciences at the University of Saskatchewan. Great to have you, Brian. Thanks, Morris. Uh, I can see why everybody squinted when they got up here now. <laughs> Pretty bright. Anyway, welcome to uh, this final day and the final plenary session of uh, this extraordinary meeting. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. We're continuing this morning uh, in the theme of talking not only about the quantity of what we produce, we're going to hear about that, but also the quality. And our first speaker, David Zidiak, uh, is going to talk to us about uh, the quality aspect of that. David is the commercial leader, grains and oils division of Dow AgriSciences. David has responsibility for leading the canola, sunflower, and grain food traits commercial strategy for the company. David grew up on a family grain farm in Western Canada. He attended the University of Manitoba, in other words, another one of the Manitoba mafia, like Ross Nagel and so on, and uh, graduated in 1981. Now, it's not all bad because he got his degree in plant science. He tempered that a little bit by adding some economics to it, but uh, the base was, was pretty good. David has been involved in the development of the plant genetics and biotechnology strategy for Dow AgriSciences since the mid-1990s. And as part of that, he helped create uh, Dow AgriSciences' healthy oils portfolio, including the Nexera canola program. 
David has worked with ag Dow AgriScience for over 30 years. Uh, he also serves on the board of directors of the Canola Council of Canada. Please uh, join me in welcoming David to the podium. Thank you, Brian. And uh, good morning, everyone. That certainly was a great uh, evening last night. Um, it uh, kind of helps bring things in perspective. Um, of course, after yesterday, and after what uh, Stuart Smythe talked about, I went home, I got my resume ready because it might be out of business, but uh, hopefully there's, uh, we can mobilize and resolve some of these uh, issues that our industry faces here. So um, for the last 15 years, I've been uh, kind of offered a unique uh, perspective on how food and agriculture kind of work together uh, and, and come about. So you know, what we do is really put new traits, quality traits into uh, oilseed crops and uh, put them into high quality seeds. We get them through uh, production agriculture. We work with the grain handling system and with the grain processing, oilseed processing system to get those uh, oil seeds converted into oils that are used by the food industry. So in the course of the last, even the last month, I kind of get a unique perspective of the value chain. So in the last month, I've met with uh, senior marketing people from one of the largest packaged food companies in the U.S. I've met with senior management from a couple of the leading North American oilseed processors, and I've been out in the field the last while taking a look at how our new hybrids are performing. So I've got a, a good understanding of what it takes to kind of get things through this system and kind of what the hurdles are and what the opportunities are. And a lot of the good things that have been done through plant science that have had direct consumer benefits. So I remember back about 2000 when um, mid 90s, 2000, when ag biotech was really beginning to uh, commercialize in Canada. And there was a lot of debate about how do we uh, demonstrate benefits to the consumer and it still kind of remains as a challenge for us. I think what Rob talked about last night is uh, really um, critical to un and understand the issues that, that we face and uh, also but the opportunities attached around to it. So let's, um, we'll get into it here. So our markets are really changing. Um, we're at a real inflection point in terms of what our consumer base is going to be, both domestically and internationally. And um, within, I think, the next five years, the millennials will be the largest demographic or cohort of consumers in North America with a great buying power and they eat very differently than what their parents have. And we'll see more about that in a, in, in, a, in a moment. Part of it also comes back to this notion of how people want to eat and what they perceive is in their food, the kind of quality that they're after and what they're aspiring to. Um, the issues around traceability and food safety because of things like E. coli or salmonella and even in organic food have kind of raised some concern about food safety by many consumers. And the issue attached, and that kind of drives out the, the need for people wanting to buy or shop local. They kind of perceive local as a way that they can go and see where their food is coming from, get a better understanding or appreciation of its authenticity. So authentic food is a real theme, and that kind of leads up to the, to the no sign, where people want additives out of their foods, and you see a big food responding to this. So as we talk about internally, you know, big food doesn't create trends, they follow them. They spend a tremendous amount of money understanding what consumers' purchase behaviors are and what they're trying to buy. And then they're trying to deliver and create products to meet those needs or meet those trends. That's why we end up with things that are kind of bizarre, like you know, the gluten-free fad. Um, we end up with things like coconut oil, getting the position that it has, and, uh, and also real things about people wanting to get additives out of their food products or only having a, a, a food product label where there's only things on there they would have found, you know, in, in their grandmother's pantry, so to speak. So very clean labels is a real driver in here. Another thing that's really important, and this is a real uh, milestone. So for the first time ever, people are spending more money outside of the home on food than what they are on buying groceries. So we're finally kind of crossing that inflection point where people are spending more outside the home than inside the home on buying and, and eating food. And so this has got a kind of a twofold importance in here. One is that then there's greater need actually for, um, for more convenient food. 
and especially if you look at the millennial population or as the food companies refer to them as the, the millennial hells and trying to market to that, to that group. So they want convenient food, they want fresh food, they want it to be you know, packaged in a certain way, they want it to taste great. And those are tremendous hurdles and it's putting great pressure on the R&D systems of a lot of food companies. Um, and so it really is changing uh, how we're eating and, um, and what's also then driving a change in the, in the ingredients that companies need. So if we're gonna package more food, then we need oils that have greater stability or products that have greater stability that can bring shelf life but remain fresh and the one it done is sort of in a natural, authentic way. Uh, we need um, ingredients that can sort of stand up to or being used in the commercial kitchen that have got long durability for that kind of, uh, that kind of use pressure. Uh, also, we talked a lot about nine billion people, and I won't dwell on that. That's been very well covered. But the other element of that is the spending power of this growing uh, emerging middle class. So something like 80% of the population outside of the West uh, is moving into this middle class uh, uh, group. And they've got the same aspirations that we have. They want to eat like we do. They want to consume the goods and services like we do. And so that's a tremendous opportunity for us as an export country in Canada. Uh, but it also uh, puts a lot of demand on the, on, on, the supply, on the food supply chains, as we'll see. So uh, that's going to be a really powerful force. And of course, if you're looking at this uh, data here, it's something like uh, $28 trillion. And this is by 2030, it's not by 2050. So that's a tremendous amount of buying and purchasing power that will have a great influence, uh, especially in countries that are, that are not self-sufficient in their own food production systems. Of course, uh, that wealth, uh, or newfound wealth, is also going to lead to some unintended consequences. And so, uh, you know, they'll likely get as sick as we are in terms of, uh, of what they're going to be eating or moving to. So this notion of the globalization of the Western diet, and you see it in many countries where sort of regional uh, diet patterns are shifting into kind of more a homogeneous diet pattern. You see it across Europe. You certainly see it in North America. You know, we eat Mexican food as often as we would eat what I traditionally grew up on. And um, so if we're going to export sort of our diet around the world, that likely means that we're going to have uh, foods that are more calorie dense and then the consequences of obesity that go with it. And, you know, obesity is probably the largest cause of uh, morbidity and mortality in, in the first world today because of all the unintended diseases or chronic diseases that go along with it. So in terms of uh, back to the demand side, so if we just take a look at global vegetable oil, and, um, and this is by 2025. And so the forecast is, is that within that period of time, we'll need another 50 million tons of oil, of new oil supply to help feed this, this growing demand. So that's equivalent to 143 million acres of canola. That's seven Western Canada canola crops in terms of, of production. So that's a tremendous uh, number in terms of, uh, of future demand. A great, a great opportunity for agriculture, uh, but also there's a tremendous challenge in here in terms of the ability to do it and uh, being able to do it in a way that is very sustainable because uh, that is certainly going to be an important uh, requirement and need going, going forward. So let's shift a little bit then to take a look at, um, at, at more the quality side of, of, of my talk. So uh, this is a, an analysis done that was published about five years ago. And so to taking a look at the annual deaths due to dietary risk factors. And so what are things in our diet that are the greatest uh, risk factors for and that are tied back to uh, death. So too much salt in our diet, not enough long chain omega-3s in our diet, too many trans fats in our diet, um, alcohol, although you never, would not have recognized that last night, um, low intakes of fruits and vegetables, and then too many saturated fats in our diet. Now, the things that I have uh, circled are things that we can really uh, affect through plant science. So those are really good opportunities for plant science and for production agriculture to bring some direct consumer um, solutions to. So if we take a look at fat, and this chart kind of explains why consumers are so confused. So in the last 30 years, we've had a complete 
180 reversal on the role that fat plays in our diet and the consequence of fat in our diet. This is an amazing story. Um, and the unintended consequences from this have been, you know, uh, really at the root of the obesity crisis. So if you go back to 1980, at that point in time, you know, the recommendation was, was to avoid fat, especially saturated fat and cholesterol. And around that period of time, there was a Midwestern industrialist called uh, Phil Sokolov, and he had a heart attack in his 40s. And um, he wondered why, he thought he was quite fit, but he, he suffered a, uh, a heart attack. And then he began to look at his diet, and he learned that the majority of the fats in his diet were saturated, and they were from a tropical, a tropical source. And so he alone, on his own dime, kind of in very Donald Trump fashion, uh, started taking out, a, he took out a campaign called The Poisoning of America. And in that campaign, he took out full page ads in USA Today, warning people about saturated fats and tropical oils, and just drove the food industry uh, just nuts. And um, so what happened then is there was a really rapid conversion away from tropical oils in North America. And the solution of the day was hydrogenated oils. And so there's this rapid conversion of tr tropical oils to partially hydrogenated oils. Um, and so people thought that was a great solution. These things were very functional. You could really tailor their functionality. Um, you could, um, they came mostly out of soybean oil. So two thirds of canola and, and soybean, you know, ended up hydrogenated. And it wasn't on the label. So people thought you're eating canola oil or eating, you know, uh, soybean oil. But really what you're eating was partially hydrogenated oil and they were full of trans fats. And so in the course of the 1990s, we began to learn that trans fats really are uh, uh, me me metabolic poisons. And so they are much worse than saturated fats. Drive up your bad cholesterol, drive down your good cholesterol. They're attached to weight gain and a number of other issues. So um, fast forward to 20, uh, 25, you know, labeling was put in place in most parts of the world to let consumers know if a food product contained trans fats or not, and they could make a decision uh, based on that, if they wanted to eat that or not. And then by 2015, you know, trans fats, uh, the FDA has removed grass status for trans fats, essentially. And so they've really been eliminated from the diet for, for, for the um, uh, most part. The other side of it, too, is that then the attitude towards, towards fat in general. So people thought fat was what made us fat. People thought that fat is what gave us heart disease. Turns out it was all wrong. Um, very unfortunate, because that's what also drove, you know, the, the snack well craze. And so you took fat out of a lot of food, you replaced it with sugar, and there's a lot of evidence to say that that is kind of at the root cause of the obesity crisis. So we're at the point today that fat's good. You can eat all you want. So the news is out. Have at it. Uh, but one little caveat the quality of fat is most important. And so uh, trans is bad. We know uh, that it is very, um, it's got very uh, cr crucial side effects. And the saturated fat is probably the risk factor in terms, uh, their leading risk factor in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease. So in terms of healthy oils, unsaturated oils uh, that are liquid, or actually our diets are deficit. So in other words, you eat more of that and less of the others. And so, um, it really is a complete change in terms of the attitude. And there's a lot of confusion even around if saturates are bad or not. So to further complicate things, we know that things like uh, steridonic acid are probably a good saturated fat, but I think we've done enough to harm consumers in terms of their understanding of these issues. But um, um, what this has done too, it's really opened up a lot of avenue for innovation uh, by, the, by the seed industry. And so looking at crops like canola, like sunflower, like soybean, there's been a lot of effort put into putting in very different fatty acid profiles into these major oilseed crops. And so there's been a ton of innovation brought into this. And we'll talk a bit more about some of these um, later. But it really created a great um, opportunity. So looking backwards a little bit at the trans fat kind of uh, case study, um, what it did is it completely changed the kind of oil that we eat. So in a space of about four or five years, there's been this massive public health experiment in the US or in North America where we've completely taken trans fats out. 
uh, hydrogenated oils out, a lot of saturates out, and we've put in a lot of monounsaturated fats. And so here you can see this uh, purple line when trans fats were labeled in 2004. And so this is the use of oils in food only. So we've taken up biodiesel and, and other industrial applications. So this is the use of oil just in uh, food systems. You can see that uh, the, the large drop in the consumption of soybean oil and then the large rise in canola oil and the large rise in palm oil. And so the story behind that too is that 80% uh, of that growth in canola was from uh, high oleic canolas. And palm oil came in to really replace fully hydrogenated soybean oil and a lot of naturally stable oils like high oleic canola, like new sun, uh, like corn oil, uh, we began to get used as a way to replace partial hydrogenation. So we switched up the functionality of the oil, and that changed a large uh, ways in cropping and imports and different uh, oils that, that we use today. The other side of it, too, is that you know, we went back and calculated that uh, you know, high lake canola is probably one of the largest solutions in terms of getting trans fats out of the diet. And we've calculated that on an annual basis, we've removed about 1.5 billion pounds of trans fat out of the American diet. Uh, that's a tremendous amount of trans fat, and given that I think of something like two grams of consumption a day increased your cardiovascular disease risk by about 50%. And so this study that was done uh, by the Harvard School of Public Health that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2005, in there they calculated that uh, trans fats were responsible for about 250,000 cardiac events per year. And so, you know, the data isn't out yet on looking backwards now have we decrease that many heart attacks per year, we'll find. But the first piece of evidence is from the Centers of Disease Control, and they do uh, sort of a monitoring survey program, and what they found is that the, the level of trans fats in, in blood plasma, and circulating blood, has dropped by about 60% uh, by, by 2012, I think it was. So we're being able to see that we swapped out the oil that we eat, it's had an impact then on sort of what's inside of us, and hopefully that's going to manifest itself in, in reduced uh, cardiovascular events. Also, it's led to things like innovation in sunflower oil. Uh, soon there'll be a zero saturated fat sunflower oil. Saturates less than 3%, a 93% monounsaturated fat. Great tasting oil, very, very stable. Uh, in North America, we don't eat that much uh, sunflower oil, but in Europe, uh, they eat a tremendous amount of sunflower oil, and, but they still use a lot of palm oil. They didn't use that much hydrogenated oil. So being able to bring in that functionality that can help reduce uh, saturated fat content in products by 70% is another great uh, con consumer um, solution. So, you know, we saw that there was unintended consequences uh, to our health from having trans fats in the diet. But what about monounsaturates? And uh, so they work well. They've got great functionality, great oxidative stability. They work well in kitchens, work well in packaged food systems. But a lot of work done in the last five, six years have also shown that they've got really health promotive benefits. We know that they reduce blood cholesterol and triglyceride levels. We know that the body burns different fatty acids differently. And there's a lot of work because there's a dedicated clinical trial being done by the Canola Council right now that shows that diets that are high in monounsaturates, uh, people have a better ability to manage weight and to uh, reduce uh, adipose fat tissue. So, you know, if this thing works, you no longer see men with that beautiful pear-shaped body hanging around their uh, belly. Um, we know that they improve insulin sensitivity, they reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes, they reduce blood pressure, and they improve endothelial function, and so they can make our arteries more plastic and you have less chance of a sudden uh, you know, uh, cardiac event. <clears throat> I'd like to come back and focus back to that chart and talk about uh, omega-3s. I think this is a fantastic story, and the more we've gotten into it and what I've learned, you know, it's, a, I think, just a, um, a great opportunity for, for, for plant science to demonstrate a really strong and direct consumer benefit. So long-chain omega-3s are important uh, at all points of our uh, age, especially important, you know, uh, for pregnant moms. They really help uh, fetal brain and eye development. It's something like half the fat in our brain is DHA, and our body can't make it. it has to come in through our diet. I think 90% of the fat in our eye is DHA, and our body can't uh, make it. 
and Western Canada um, is not, or the Midwest too, is not known, you know, for its local fishery. So uh, it's difficult to get these into the diet, and kids don't like eating fish. Also, part of that too is the reason why infant formula today, by law in many places, has to be fortified with DHA. And there's um, interesting studies out of the UK by Ann Richards that show that being able to put, um, I think like 500 milligrams of DHA into uh, children sort of as a supplement, they made a dramatic improvement in their reading scores because they took the bottom third of kids and these children didn't have you know, any kind of uh, deficit disorders or any kind of you know, uh, consequential health issue, but they took the bottom third of kids and they moved their reading scores up to the mean of the group just through supplementation. Kids were able to focus better, uh, better cognitive skills, They're really an amazing story. So in infants and children, you know, it's responsible to help form out our neural pathways, our brain development, and adults really powerful and improving our cardiovascular health, and a lot of evidence that shows that as we get older, which is pretty much everybody in this room, um, it can really help maintain our cognitive capacity. And so, you know, as us baby boomers are getting old, we want to do it with style and with quality, and uh, being able to maintain uh, our cognitive capacity to reduce the risk of dementia, et cetera, are really important um, you know, health, public health issues. And there's a lot of evidence that uh, I think even in Europe they've got uh, qualified health claims that are consuming a certain level of long chain omega-3s can really help modulate the, the risk of, of, of dementia forming. So a really powerful um, nutrient that our diets are deficit in. So I got this slide from the, uh, from the Global Omega-3 Organization. And so that purple bar, or that purple line across the midpoint there at 500 milligrams, that's their recommended target dietary intake. And then the other bar charts or histograms show the relative intakes in different countries by population. So uh, only about one billion, say out of seven billion people are eating enough, uh, getting enough long chain omega-3s in their diet. If you take a look at large uh, populations like China and in India, you know, the consumption is so low. And so that goes into, um, you know, from, for infants, for children, and also, you know, for, uh, for adults. That's an amazing story. Now, the other side of it, if everybody decided to get the RDI of omega-3s, there you know, would not be a fish left on the planet. So you know, how, do we, how do we fix that? And, um, you know, we can see that the majority of long-chain omega-3s you know, are consumed in the United States and in Europe, but the really growth is in, uh, is in Asia. So how do we supply it, and then what kind of form do we supply it in? Today, a lot of these uh, supplements, are, or, or we take it as supplements. We go to Costco, buy fish oil, pop those pills, uh, but there really is not much in food systems today. And, you know, why? Well... <clears throat> Kids really don't want their peanut butter to taste like salmon. Um, don't want your cheese to taste like, or yogurt to taste like salmon. And the, these oils are quite unstable, so they're hard to use in food systems. And today they're very, very expensive. And so it's hard to put into a food product and maintain a good uh, cost point. And, so, and it's hard to deliver them with great taste. So a number of companies are working on making DHA or long chain omega-3s in different crop systems. Uh, we have a program on in canola. And it's really uh, turning out as a really, um, really interesting product. A great fatty acid profile, low in saturates, uh, very high in monounsaturates, uh, highly enriched with DHA. So we can deliver on all these benefits that relate to cardiovascular health, eye health, neurological health. And they taste great. Taste like canola oil. They've got a clean, light taste. They're free of all those marine sensory effects that you would get from fish oil. They've got... Uh, a very high degree of oxidative stability, so they can be used in a much wider variety of food systems now. But probably the best benefit of a crop-based system is going to be the cost, and it's going to be the sustainability of it. So um, we can uh, produce them at a much lower cost structure. We can produce them really at the cost of canola oil, which would allow it to go into a wide variety of food products that they can't be used in today. And we can make them globally available, you know, from Canada, we export canola to virtually every part of the world. You can do the same thing out of Europe if they would grow it there, but they probably won't, at least in the near term. And so we've got good reach to maybe to really allow this to get supplied on, on a global basis. Um, 
the other interesting thing in here, too, is taking a look at the impact on healthcare costs. So this is a study recently where a group in the U.S. took a look at just fish oil, and they believe that uh, they would save, you could save the healthcare system up to $1.7 billion annually in hospital costs alone just through supplementation and getting people up to these target levels. Um, sort of did the math on looking at our program, and with 150,000 hectares of DHA-rich canola, we could supply all of North America with their RDI, with a clean tasting, cost-effective, and sustainable supply. That 150,000 hectares of DHA canola would also uh, prevent the need for the equivalent of 50 million salmon being harvested every year. So there's a great twofer in there, you know, being able to make it accessible, use it in a wide variety of food systems, have it cost effective, and really do a lot for sustainability of our oceans. Now, would people buy it because it's a biotech food? You know, this is some of the most complicated uh, plant science that our people have undertaken. You know, essentially, what they did is they dropped in a whole new metabolic pathway in the canola and got it to operate. So amazing, amazing plant science. But this study was done by IFIC, the International Food Information Council, you know, in their annual survey of consumers. And uh, they asked people, looking at uh, food biotechnology, what they would be likely to buy or not buy. And we can see in the top box, if you can't read it, it says that food product made with oils modified by biotechnology to provide more healthful fats like omega-3 in the food. 72% of people said that they would, uh, they, would, they would buy that product. So, um, you know, if we can deliver a great benefit and solve a need like we just talked about, you know, maybe the consumer acceptability for a, for a GMO might be uh, much, much higher than what we've seen in the past because it's something that they can relate to very directly versus an indirect benefit that we see through, through production agriculture. We'll switch topics here a little bit and move to uh, protein. Um, you know, oil seed crops are 45% oil, 55% protein meal. And a uh, study done by Rabobank last June shows that by 2030, I'm sorry, by 2023, so in the course of the next, you know, seven, eight years, the demand for protein meal is going to rise by 37%. That's an incredible number, given the fact how much it's expanded in the last while. And if, uh, of course, the major supplier in there is a soybean. Um, and this forecast, or the soybean industry, is really requiring that significant yield increases be realized to help deliver on this future demand. And, of course, a third of that demand is going to come out of China. So one of the other things that uh, we've worked on is a uh, high-protein canola meal. And so, you know, canola has always been disadvantaged to soybean meal because of the high fiber content, a lower protein content, a higher fiber content. So we had, you know, a lot of that canola meal was kind of like dead space from a nutrition perspective, and so you couldn't use it in a lot of um, monogastric feed rations. Works great in dairy. Uh, something like 90% of all the canola meal that we produce in Canada goes to the California dairy market, so we're re really reliant upon uh, one market outcome too. We also export half of the canola that we produce in Canada. You know, something like 10 million tons per year gets exported. A third of that is bought by China. And so uh, the opportunity to provide uh, those markets with an improved protein product uh, could have some real uh, value. So what we were able to do uh, was move the protein content of canola up to in the range of about 44%. And uh, you've got soybean meal running, you know, 46 to 48 percent. Argentine, I think, soybean meal, maybe 44 percent. Uh, soybean meal coming out of the northern tier of the United States uh, probably runs in the lower edge of that, of that range. So we've improved the uh, protein content up to 44 percent. Also, what we did is get rid of some of the acid detergent fiber, which is a real issue for, for animals. And so uh, we dropped that from 16 percent down to 11 percent. So what we get uh, here then is this great release of energy, a much more digestible protein. You get a great energy release. Uh, we've done work with the University of Illinois with some of the leading swine and poultry nutrition people. And what they came back and told us was that you can replace 100% of the soybean meal in a, mo in, in, a, in a monogastric, in a swine or a poultry ration uh, with this uh, um, high-protein canola meal versus soybean meal. 
And so in countries that um, have, say, domestic production, could be a great local source, you take a look at Europe. Europe today spends close to a billion dollars on freight to import soybean meal. And they have a large domestic oilseed rape production system, but of course the meal quality isn't as good. So um, we're very excited about the potential for this. So to kind of begin to wrap up here, um, you know, this is from the uh, Canola Council of Canada from their strategic plan. And the green bar, green line on top shows the acres of canola in Canada, and the black line is the seed output. And so we can see since 2004, this increase in production and this increase in, 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 in yield. Uh, but the acres that we're going to grow on is pretty much capped out. We won't get much past where we are today. But the demand continues to increase. And so today we produce probably in the range of 17 million tons a day. By 2025, uh, the council forecast will be producing 26 million tons. So almost a 50% increase in the crop off the same acres. That's a tremendous productivity gain. Um, so being able to do it is going to be, as we talked about last night, you know, may be the real critical issue in here. A lot of it will come out of genetics, but a lot of it will also, too, come out of information technology and improved management systems. So in the next 10 years, you know, a tremendous uh, forecast in terms of, of a productivity output for canola. So that means we need to find new markets for things like meal, but we can also play an important part in helping to feed um, parts of the world that are going to be demanding more oil and demanding more uh, protein. So a second last slide. You know, a while ago I found this in The Economist magazine, and I think it's a great comment on the, on the productivity of agriculture. Um, and I sort of took that, did a quick analysis looking at Western Canada. So since 1970 in Western Canada, we've expanded the output of uh, prairie crops by 400% on the same amount of land, and we've done this with 55% fewer farmers. That's an amazing, um, you know, legacy or uh, testament to what agriculture has been able uh, to do. Uh, but we also know that these productivity gains are kind of peaking out. So to do, to do the next jump, we won't have the same level of a slope or, or curve on it. Um, so I think what was uh, talked about last night is really, uh, or yesterday, is really important. If you go back to Stuart Smythe, and what he talked about is the ability to, to keep doing what, what we're doing. And an important, and he touched on one thing, and I don't know if people had sort of picked up on it, but if you look at a crop like canola, in Canada, it's a really important uh, crop for us. In Europe, a really important crop. But it's not a big crop in the global scheme of things. So the ability for a crop like canola to access plant biotechnology and to use it is really under threat. The cost, the regulatory burden to develop a new trait is so expensive today. So I was telling Wolf Keller, you know, in I think around 1993, we had the first Ag International Biotech Conference here in Saskatoon. At that time, we talked about developing a new uh, biotech trait would be eight to ten million dollars. Today, that number is in the range of $100 million. So you need a really powerful business case to be allowed to invest $100 million on something that's 10 years away. And so the ability for smaller crops to access advanced biotechnology is going to be a real critical issue uh, into, into the future. Um, and the second thing is the opportunity to use it. And you know, Rob Syke put that across quite well last night. So you know, we've got the science, but will we have the ability to use it? And, um, and can we afford to use it? So that uh, wraps up my talk. Thank you very much. I really would like to thank the uh, organizers for the ability to participate this morning and opening up a great uh, dialogue among all of us. And uh, welcome to Western Canada. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. That was a wonderful summary of nutrition. I'm Susan Whiting. I teach nutrition here at the University of Saskatchewan, and I'm a member of the um, GIFS uh, CREF group. Um, there's just a few, uh, and, and I applaud your product. DHA is definitely missing from our diets. Um, and everyone in this room should be afraid, you know, not just for themselves, but for their families. Um, there's just a, a few other things that are going on in the EPA, DHA world, though. 
a recent article came out and said that actually the conversion of linolenic to DHA differs among population groups. And so those in primarily what we might call vegetarian societies like East, uh, Southeast Asia really have a higher conversion rate. And so I think the DHA problem might be more a North American, uh, European problem than worldwide, but definitely this is a product. Um, there's other sources like DHA eggs, so that's kind of a nice thing that it um, automatically gets converted. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out with this high fat, low fat story is that part of it is um, the, the problems were when you reduce your fat, what do you replace it with? And unfortunately, we replaced it with starch and sugar, not fiber. So we really need to get that fiber message out. And I guess the last thing is I'm a little dismayed at the rise in animal production when really we want a global shift. And there actually was an article recently called Shift Away from Animal Protein to Plant Protein. And that those of us who are keen on pulse crops are really trying to get that message across. So I just wanted to raise a few other issues. But no, those are all really good points, and thank you. Um, I think that the notion of, um, you know, I was talking about fat. I didn't talk about everything. And certainly fiber in the diet is probably almost more important uh, of an issue than, than the quality of fat that we eat. But it's hard to get people to eat, get 25 grams of fiber in their diet. I've tried. And... Uh, there's a lot of unintended consequences to that, too. Um, <clears throat> and it would be good that, you know, that uh, like on the protein side, um, you know, the, the ability to provide plant protein is a great notion, but it's very difficult to do beyond soy. You know, we don't have processing capacity, technology. We need to make those things a bigger part of our diet because we're so deficit in a lot of those really healthful food components. And so... You know, it's a balance of everything. It's not, this isn't the be-all and end-all to fix all the ails of, of uh, you know, our human diet, but we do need all the things that you talked about for sure. Great uh, to talk, Dave. A uh, couple of questions and a comment. Number one is uh, canola, obviously, uh, you know, huge crop here in Canada. You know, some increasing uh, acreages in soybean, but soybean is a big, big crop around the world. And while you're doing this great stuff and the industry is doing this great stuff on canola, I doubt that the soybean industry is going to sit back and not maybe use some of the same tools to get to some of the same endpoints. I'm just wondering from a competition standpoint, you know, how big of a factor that is for the canola industry. A second point I'd make in the more comment is it still bugs me a little bit, and this is no knock on the olive oil industry, but it still bugs me a little bit when I go into stores and you just see the array and the keen marketing that the olive oil industry has done. And I've often thought on the Conference Board of Canada when they did their food strategy, I thought they introduced an interesting notion when they talked about how companies like Johnny Walker's and Wolf Blast, you know, you got yellow label, red label, blue label, you know, and in the scotch industry, well, Ted Menzies drinks the black label stuff because, you know, he's a sophisticated guy. But I've often thought maybe, you know, that would be a way for the canola industry to differentiate itself in the, in the marketplace. That was an interesting twist, but my, my main question is about the competition from soy and them using the same tools to get to some of the same endpoints. Yeah, that's a good question, Lauren. And, you know, I think um, I could look at it this way. In the past, the issue was, well, in agriculture, if somebody won, someone else had to lose. Um, but I think going forward, the demand for food is going to be, that problem is so immense, it's going to be, we need to produce more of everything. And things will find, uh, I think, find their home. To produce DHA canola, we don't need millions of acres. You know, we need hundreds of thousands of acres. So is that really an opportunity that would be attractive to someone in the soybean industry? Plus, those soybean plants are so large. And for them to do a little one, one or two day IP run of a specialty oil, doesn't really fit well within that uh, model. Plus, it's only 18% oil versus canola being 45, so there's some uh, economic benefits that way. So I think, you know, um, like we're going to need more of everything, and, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of vast stores of oilseed crops around the world today, so I think it's kind of proof of that. Let's take one more question. Uh -huh. 
Thanks for a very nice talk. I have two points to mention uh, about your thing. When we, the first is when we talk about public health, I think it's not only oil, it's also equally important that we talk about sugar. But sugar and oil is actually deadlier than just the oil. So public health actually should get affected by sugar as well. And second point is, uh, we talk about the climate resilient and, and climate smart agriculture, and we write in, in papers that we need to diversify the portfolio of crop species that we are growing now. Uh, so how would you think private industry can help in bringing those species into the mainstream, or at least bring them to the platter in the local communities? Sure. Um, on the first topic of sugar, um, I think sugar is becoming public enemy number one in the U.S. And so the current administration, as they leave office, they've got uh, a couple uh, things that they want to really accomplish, and that's one of them. And so I think that there's a large movement within the nutrition industry, not the nutrition industry, the, the nutrition um, expertise within the health community to really pe make people aware of the consequence of sugar in their diet and the, and the other impacts of it. So that's, I think that's underway. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch the second question, the second part. Could you? Yeah, that's that's always a tough question, you know, because um, you know, as a large company, we're spending someone else's money, and we need to get a, get a return on it. And and I don't know if big companies do that kind of thing very well, actually. Um, I think that you know we're good at big projects, but going into someplace local and working on something specialized like that, I don't know if we've really got the right skill set to really do those kinds of things effectively. So I think being able to, I think what is happening though is that there is an understanding of the need for that to happen. And so the ability for large companies to share what's in their toolbox and make them available to smaller crops, you see that happening. I think you see people sharing expertise so maybe lending out people that can help transfer knowledge and technology to make that work, and then being able to help uh, you know, put money into more local programs, either universities or other ways to be able to help, uh, help those crops. Because we can't lose those crops. It can't be a world of corn, soybeans, wheat, and canola. You know, we need these things. We need pulse crops. And it's hard for them to get access to the toolbox that big crops have and to access all that expertise. So that's a really, really important question. They are not really keen into going into something which is already there. No, that's a good point, too, and I've seen that. And so if you're a cosmetic company, a personal care company, you'll go find the weirdest thing you can, and you put it in a bottle, we'll put it on our face and pay big dollars for it. Um, <laughs> but if you're a big food company, you know, it's cost-driven, and uh, they want to focus on redundant supply chains with two suppliers, and you can buy it by, by the shipload or by the unit train load. Thank you. Thank you.